Hi, it's Fraser here. Before we get into this week's Spiked podcast, I just wanted to let you know about an incredibly exciting event we've got coming up. For his next live podcast, Brendan O'Neill will be in conversation with Michael Schellenberger. For those of you who don't know, Michael Schellenberger is a best-selling author, and he's one of the journalists behind the Twitter files. Michael and Brendan will be talking about everything from the censorship industrial complex to the cult of climate change and much, much more. The event is free if you're a Spiked supporter. All you have to do is claim your free ticket from the online donor hub. And if you're not a Spike supporter, then now is the time to sign up. For just £5 per month, not only will you get access to this free event, you'll also get access to many, many other exclusive perks from ad-free reading to access to the comment section and access to all kinds of other events like this one. So to become a Spike supporter, just go to spikes-online.com forward slash supporters. That's spikes-online.com forward slash supporters. See you at the event. Hello and welcome back to the Spiked podcast. I'm Fraser Myers and joining me this week we have Spiked columnist Luke Gittos. Hello. And writer and broadcaster Candice Holdsworth. Hello. Coming up on today's show we'll be discussing if it's time to leave the European Convention on Human Rights, the madness of Mari Black and the myth of global boiling. So a lot of senior conservatives have been mulling the idea of leaving the European Convention on Human Rights, particularly if uh, their migration policies continue to be blocked in the courts. Uh, Robert Jenrick, the immigration minister, hinted heavily at this when he said that we should do whatever it takes to control Britain's borders. And it's believed that around a third of the cabinet are potentially in favour of leaving the ECHR. Look, this news has been sort of floated in the middle of a week that's been about the small boats. The Tories have tried to put our focus on this. They've made a flurry of announcements, um, for instance, opening up the Bibby Stockholm, signing a deal with Turkey. Uh, they've threatened uh, immigration lawyers with, you know, severe jail penalties if they lie, stuff like that. But that to one side, I mean, is this the kind of proposal we should take seriously? You know, should we be thinking about leaving the ECHR? Well, I think the first time the Tories promised that they would take us out of the ECHR was in 2005. I think mm. I remember seeing that in their manifesto back then. And it's been an electoral promise ever since. So if you believe in politicians doing what they say, then they probably should start taking it seriously. Um, is it something we should do? Definitely yes. Mm. This discussion about the ECHR isn't really just about that one court or about one piece of law. It's about democracy and it's about who makes the important political decisions that govern our lives. And I think what the Tory party need to recognise is that people are sick of headlines which says that a court over which they have no control mm. is intervening to prevent policies being carried out. Now, there are all sorts of legal uh, niceties about this debate, but there is a fundamental democratic deficit with the European Court of Human Rights. We have no control over the judges who sit there. We have no power to vote them in or out. They are completely unaccountable to anyone in Europe. Uh, they are appointed and they can take decisions which have political consequences. So in the context of the migrant debate, we saw what have become known as pajama injunctions mm. being issued. So pajama injunctions are so-called because judges sitting in Strasbourg issue injunctions in the middle of the night to prevent particular things from happening. In the migrant case, they stopped the uh, flight leaving to Rwanda with um, migrants on board. Um, now, I don't like the Rwanda arrangement. I certainly don't like the Bibi Stockholm, and I don't like the way that migrants are being discussed in this discussion. I think they have been dehumanised, yeah. and I think that's wrong. But I think people also have a legitimate concern over who is making the decisions in this debate, and it has to be the British people and not judges in Strasbourg. Yeah, I mean, that's right, isn't it, Candice? You know, there are lots of problems with some of the Tory proposals. The migration bill seems particularly um, authoritarian, this idea that, you know, migrants won't be able to have access to a lawyer, that immediately, as soon as they're found to have come into the UK illegally, they have no chance of um, getting asylum, things like that. Or the Rwanda scheme, equally, you know, quite problematic, sending people off to a country where they have no connections, um, where they don't want to be, essentially. But doesn't it come down to democracy? Doesn't the UK elected government 
shouldn't they have authority and not these judges or lawyers or anyone else? Yes, that's my position exactly. I mean, there's so many things about this debate, especially around the Bibi Stocko and the migrants. I mean, it's almost punitive, which I don't mm. like. But I think 100% um, the decisions, the policy decisions in this country should be up to our elected parliament. And there shouldn't be a judge who can just come in and override those decisions. And I think that's what concerns me. And I think it mm. should, con- should concern everybody. It's quite interesting, though, because from what I know, there is a precedent with this, like with prisoners' voting rights, yeah. where the European ECHR, and I have to be careful that I say the right word, that I get it, get it correct, they did. They also opposed, they, they went against the will of, of Parliament and they said that prisoners should get rights, but Parliament was able to come together, cross-party cooperation, and say, no, this is what we want in this country, this is our policy, and from what I know, they backed away. But this doesn't seem to be happening now. And I don't know if it's because we're in a more fractious time, there's an election coming up next year, MPs are less likely to work together on this issue. But they could if they wanted to. I think there could be a resolution if the will was there, but it doesn't seem to be. Yeah, and Luke, isn't that the key problem there? The politics is very murky and strange because obviously in in some ways the government doesn't think its policies will get through. The Labour Party is too scared to oppose its policies on moral grounds. So you had the, you know, essentially they were saying, well, we wouldn't start from here, but we, we're not going to close down the barges immediately. We're not going to chuck, you know, we're not going to prevent migrants from being housed in army bases or whatever it might be. It, isn't that the key, key issue? So we're using the law instead. Yeah, I think this question has been effectively delegated from the parties in this country to the judges in Strasbourg. You're right that the uh, Labour Party are now saying that they would not roll back on any of the proposals, they certainly wouldn't close down the existing arrangements. So there is nothing to choose between the two main parties when it comes to this issue. There is no alternative plan Hmm. coming out of Starmer's camp whatsoever, uh, and no indication that one is on its way. I think it's also worth just taking it back to the ECHR, um, just thinking a little bit about how catastrophic people say it would be if we did leave the European Union, yeah. because this comes up over and over again. That we, if we, we would be like Belarus and Russia. You can choose, you can name your country, Belarus or Russia now, or Germany in the 1930s. Both <laughs> of them wow. seem to come up all the time. Yeah. And what that ignores is that all of the uh, rights and freedoms that Strasbourg purports to protect were, to a great extent, protected under our common law before mm. we joined the European Convention on Human Rights. So our courts had a body of law which protected imperfectly, but nonetheless did protect things like freedom of speech, freedom of protest, freedom of uh, you know right to a private life, etc. All of yeah. that existed in our courts already. And arguably, the English common law in some respects went further than the European court has ever done in protecting these freedoms. Um, and what we need to recognise is that leaving this convention would not leave us uh, destitute and unfree. In fact, it could actually reignite the debate around these freedoms in a really productive way. I think what we've seen over recent years is that the threat to our freedom comes from legislation. Yeah. What I mean by that is that Parliament is still free to pass some pretty draconian legislation in recent years. We've seen the um, Public Order Act, which has effectively closed down the right to protest. Mm. Um, we've seen uh, reams of uh, new prosecutions with respect to hate crimes, uh, free, you know, affronts to free speech um, that, that seem to get no attention from, hu- from human rights lawyers whatsoever. So our attention needs to turn to how law is made, not um, the human rights courts, who are actually pretty powerless to stop some of these draconian acts coming in. Well, the, the example that comes to mind for me is, you know, lockdown. Where, where were all the human rights lawyers? Where were the human rights courts then when we had our right to literally leave the house? taken away from us, a right that we didn't even think we need to, we'd ever need to worry about. I know. And, and when people were put in those quarantine hotels, mm. I mean, they'd gone abroad to visit family. In some cases, they, had, they were grieving. I mean, they'd gone for a funeral and they came back and they were lined up at the airport and taken to a hotel and told them, you'll pay for the privilege as well. And there were a few, there were a few legal challenges to that, but not much, actually. Nothing like we see now. Not when it's, because I don't think it was... Um, politically advantageous for them to do so. Yeah. Well, there were legal challenges and they were refused by the courts because the courts give significant deference to parliament to make their own laws and to um, to, 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 to craft the rules that we live by. Um, and that's why it's so important to hold these uh, our politicians to account politically mm. when they pass such dr- draconian laws. And that's the answer to the migrant question. It's we have to put pressure on them politically to come up with a solution that works. And I just wanted to ask you before we finish about the question of lawyers. You know, the government is um, on the warpath, it says, 
against uh, what it refers to as lefty lawyers usually. There's been some stories coming out um, from the Mail on Sunday about like quite dodgy lawyers um, making up stories, making up bogus asylum claims and things like that. Why do you think that um, the thing that struck me is that the legal profession has really um, stood up almost for these kind of dodgy lawyers? They've said this, you, you know, an attack on one is an attack on all almost, yeah. which I find very strange. It's completely bizarre because these lawyers are dragging the profession into disrepute. Mm. The people who create false asylum claims um, to basically game the system for money, £10,000 a time, yeah. um, that is undermining the rule of law. So when the bars, as, the, as you mentioned, the Bar Standards Board, the body who regulate barristers in this country, came out and effectively defended the, um, the dodgy immigration solicitors, they did an enormous disservice to the profession. And you know, I'm, I'm, I like to think of myself as of the left, and I'm a lawyer. Yeah. But I do manage to separate those two things out. Yeah. And you have to be very careful that when you are uh, conducting law, you are doing so in a responsible way, because it is something that um, you shouldn't use the law to, to advance your politics or if you do, you should be extremely careful about the kind of cases you take on because the risk is that you end up substituting your judgment as a lawyer for your own politics. And that's when it becomes dangerous. Well, I mean, everyone I know who has emigrated over to the United Kingdom has had to use an immigration lawyer yeah. when they're doing their forms. I mean, you actually do need legal guidance because the forms are so complex. You make one mistake, that's it. Your claim will be denied. You'll have to pay again. It costs an absolute fortune. It's a huge, hugely bureaucratic endeavor to immigrate to this country. Yeah, there's a kind of co almost computer says no yes. uh, attitude to, you know, when we're really talking about human beings. I know, <laughs> I've seen it happen. <laughs> and, I've seen it happen over just getting a small figure wrong on the form. Someone gets denied leave to remain and it's absolutely devastating. And this debate is often very polarised. Um, it's often pitted between people who want control over borders and people who want um, a complete free-for-all, um, who don't even think that migration law should be enforced or whatever that. That's not really where the public is, Luke, is it? It's just, there's a bit more nuance than that, how people see this issue. The public are clearly more sensible than our political and media class on this issue. They recognise that the illegal trade over the channel has to stop because that is just organised crime. No civilised country would put up with an open route of illegal human trafficking into mm. your country. So the public recognise that has to stop. Um, they have become broadly more sympathetic to immigration uh, since Brexit, ironically. Yep. So uh, all that talk about Brexit being racist, well, the, the public have calmed down about immigration since Brexit because they recognise that it gives more control, more democratic power over our borders. And, you know, that there is no evidence whatsoever that they are intolerant of asylum seekers. In fact, we could probably afford, if we had this condition under control, to be a lot more generous to asylum seekers and refugees. The, the key problem is um, asylum and refugee that issue has been tied up with economic migration yeah. in a really unhelpful way. We seem to think of those two things as one and the same when they're extremely different. The case to be made for economic migration is obviously very different to the case that needs to be made for asylum. And the quicker we pull those two issues apart politically, I think the better. I think that's so key, though, to say it's about control, because when you looked at refugees from Hong Kong, mm. people were so welcoming and they're actually proud to say, no, you can come here. Absolutely. Or refugees from Ukraine. There's, no, there's yes. absolutely no one protesting about that. 100 percent. Yeah. Mm. So the SNP's Mari Black has caused a, a bit of a stir this week at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. She has compared gender critical feminists to um, white supremacists and has said they're all a bunch of old Karens and they should all shut up, essentially. Um, <laughs> Candice, are you surprised by this comment in any way? No, not really. I mean, I find it hilarious, though, that she likes to call them horrible old bigots, but then calls them Karens as yeah. if, you know, it doesn't matter. They're just old middle-aged women who wants to listen to them. Her whole dismissal of them as well, it's clear that she's never really looked into it because if she had, she would see they were about as far from white supremacy as you can possibly get. Mm. I mean, in fact, a lot of the um, the gender-critical women actually came from the left yeah. and their concerns were about the mental health of teenagers, mm. homophobia and women's rights. That's and I, disgusting. Yeah, I know, it's disgusting, those Karens. And, you know, they really, I think they've been quite disciplined in how they've framed it mm. as well, you know, being very careful not to attack trans people themselves, just saying this, these are our concerns. But of course, no one's really listened to them, you yeah. know, which has been such a problem. You know, someone like J.K. Rowling has been so thoughtful in her critique and has tried time and time and time again to say, this is where I'm coming from. Mm. 
people don't actually want to listen to yeah to what she's saying and just hear something else instead I guess yes Luke you know Mari Black has got a bit of a history um of being I guess you could say a trans zealot uh there's quite a famous case uh where she brought um a drag queen called Flowjob to a local primary school in her constituency. What what do you think brings a, a member of parliament to do such a thing, to sort of lose their minds in such a way? Well, I, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> but I think it's worth just pausing to reflect on um, the irony that um, tr- trans activists tend to present um, trans people as uniquely persecuted and, and, and vilified. But actually, when you look at what is actually happening to gender critical feminists Mm. in this country, it's absolutely revolting. They are arrested, spoken to by the police, interviewed in connection with hate crime, um, and then have to face mobs of angry people whenever they try and speak, face cancellation, Mm. face um, complete vilification, and yet they continue to make their argument. And the reason why I think that's important to mention you know, threatened with violence. Yeah. You know, we've seen um, uh, uh, f- real threats of violence against these women, uh, all for speaking their mind. And yeah. whether you agree with them or not, the fact that there is um, a group of women who are willing to stand up in the face of such opprobrium and and danger, I think it's fair to say danger, and to still make their point, I think they are to be commended. And this Mari Black um, remark it's interesting that she feels so relaxed in saying something so aggressive and violent yeah. in public because it illustrates the wider context of her remark. It illustrates the kind of environment the gender critical feminists are facing. And um, I think we just need to take a moment to recognise their bravery and, make, and continuing to make their arguments in spite of people like Mari Black. Definitely. And and in the same week, you know, the, also at the Edinburgh Fringe, uh, Mari Black's SNP colleague, Joanna Cherry, she's speaking today on the day we're recording this, and her Edinburgh show has needed all this extra security. It's needed airport style scanners, bag searches. They have even stopped serving alcohol during um, her particular interview or um, in conversation in case people get rowdy, in case people want to, you know, start something. I mean, that's crazy. That's the world we're living in. The, the complete contrast where Murray Black is free to just denounce people. Yes, and I think they'd have to be you'd have to be willfully ignorant not to recognize that and not to see that as a reality. I mean, Maya Forstatter, one of the most prominent gender critical feminists, actually had to fight legally mm. to get it recognized as a legitimate point of view. And that's that is so true. That's the environment that they're in. I think with I think though the problem is is it's so tribal. This is the most one of the most tribal debates, and it really is a fight, and it's really, really difficult for there to be any center ground on it whatsoever. You know, you're either for or you're against. And that's one thing that I've really felt being in this debate. Mm. There's very little opportunity actually for both sides. Well, no, I think the gender critical feminists do show a little bit of empathy towards the other side, but the other side shows absolutely no empathy whatsoever towards them. And there's just no recognition or awareness that they're good people who've just come to a different conclusion. Yeah. That That is completely lost. I mean, they're just vilified, they're demons, and if anything is permissible against them. And you you brought up J.K. Rowling earlier. We should talk a bit about her because there's last week, I think it was, um, in Seattle, the Museum of um, uh, essentially a pop culture museum has erased her name from its Harry Potter exhibit on the grounds that, according to the museum's curator, that she is super hateful. Not just plain old hateful. She's super hateful. And similarly, a bit like um, Mari Black, you know, she's alleged that J.K. Rowling is putting in racist tropes into Harry Potter, that she's a, she likes to fat shame people, all kinds of, you know, spurious accusations uh, to the ends of essentially erasing Rowling's contribution to, um, to literature. And all of this vilification, all of this cancellation, all of these attempts to silence actually only come from one side. It's mm. from the trans activist side towards gender critical feminists. I've never heard a gender critical, critical feminist call for anyone to be hurt, yeah. call for anyone to be cancelled, call for anyone to be censored, call for anyone to be removed from a panel. They just don't do that. They they want the debate. In fact, they like to hear, you know, the other side because often when people hear it for the first time, you realize how crazy it is. Yeah. Some of the best, you know, most enlightening moments have been in in court in various court battles where trans ideologues have had tried try to try to make a case for their position in the case, you know, with mermaids versus the LGB alliance, for instance, and they just sound ridiculous. So everyone wants them to speak, actually. 
Exactly. Yes. Well, that's maybe why they shut down debate. I mean, <laughs> yeah. they know that their position is actually quite weak and won't stand up to scrutiny. They don't want to be scrutinized. Mm. And Luke, finally, do you think the tide is turning slightly? It seems as if Labour is finding its way to a more sensible position. Keir Starmer can say that a woman is an adult human female um, without mentioning that maybe 0.01% of them might have a penis. I mean, that is the hope, isn't it? But even if the main political parties get some semblance of sense about this, um, there is still a huge fight to be won. I mean, the, the the progress that needs to be made to even have this discussion in a reasonable and rational way without people having to fear for losing their livelihoods, I think we still have some way to go. Mm. Hopefully, uh, as you say, times are changing. So the rhetoric around climate change has heated up considerably in the past month or so, uh, pun intended. Uh, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says that we're no longer in the era of global warming, but the era of global boiling. You regularly read uh, newspaper headlines telling us that the world is on fire. Uh, you know, we're going to burst into flames at any moment. I mean, Candice, what have you made of this? Should we take this seriously? Should we be should we be afraid? <laughs> no, and that's the problem. I mean, when you when you start talking like this, and and that's like absolute worst case scenario. I mean, mm. that's like the runaway greenhouse effect that you, we've seen on Venus, for instance. Yeah. Then immediately people just become gripped by fear. Mm. They become gripped by fear. Instead of being able to talk rationally about mitigation, that actually there are things that we can do. But I feel like the environmental movement has become gripped by this emotionalism. It's been going on for a long time. It's led to many splits. I mean, Patrick Moore, one of the founders of Greenpeace, has become a big critic of this particular tactic that they have. Mm. But I also I also think it's very counterproductive. I think it turns people off. I think people don't like it at all. As, at all. It's like when, with Just Stop Oil and Extinction Rebellion, public opinion is very much to get, very much against them. Yeah. People don't like being made to feel afraid like this. They actually really resent it. Luke, what have you what have you made of sort of ramping up of the rhetoric? Because it just feels like it's always been bad, but now it just feels divorced from, from reality completely. Well, I set myself the challenge of finding out what global boiling is. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, apparently the definition that I was able to find um, is that it's a combination of global warming with the El Nino effect, the mm. hot wind coming in um, and unusually hot weather. But at, at its bottom, it is just something invented by Antonio Gutierrez. That's it. Yeah. It's just an idea that he came up with in a speech and then people start using it. Mm. And it is fascinating to think this is a completely unscientific term. It's worth noting also that they suggest that we are now in the era of yeah, global boiling. Yeah. It's like something has changed mm. and we are in it. We are there. And there is just nothing to suggest that the science now is any different than it was 12 months ago. It yeah. is propaganda. Now, there is, of course, an absolute case that we need to deal with when it comes to global warming. You know, there are issues we have. To, it's an issue we have to deal with. But what is really problematic is that, as Candice suggests, this kind of language of fear, mm. this language that it is out of control, this language that, there, uh, that, that suggests there is only one way to respond, yeah. which is what the UN thinks we should do, i.e. cut back, impose limits, shut things down, decarbonize, degrowth, net zero. All of this is a political response to a question. Yeah. Uh, what do we do about climate change? And they are using language and propaganda to push that particular agenda. And it's not the only response to the problem. And, and often what's bizarre is that they're wrong about the specifics. So if you think about fires, for instance, the world being on fire, it's true. You know, we have in Europe, there has been a pretty horrendous summer of fires. But if you take a kind of the global picture, it's just not true that there are more fires than there were before. You know, it seemed to peak around the year 2000, around 3% of the world was uh, burnt in that year, which is, you know, sounds quite terrifying, but I don't think people were scared of it back in 2000. Um, and it's been going down ever since because whatever the weather is throwing at us, whatever, whether temperatures are going up or not, we as human beings are getting much better at managing these problems. We are really good at managing um, natural disasters. We're better at preventing floods. You know, the amount of floods that might have happened that we don't even have to think about because we just have the techniques for stopping these from happening is extraordinary. There's a positive story there. Yes. But absolutely. we can't we can't celebrate it. We we just we're supposed to just be afraid and think that the world is going to end and you know we have no future. It is. It's it's almost it's it's cult-like. 
But it's also this sort of pre-enlightenment mysticism, you know, mm. that we have no control over the environment. It governs us. You know, we almost need to pay obeisance. We've angered the gods of yeah. nature. And I found it very interesting. And I, I didn't think I would ever refer to Alan Titchmarch on a political debate. But did you see recently he's been speaking against the whole rewilding mm. phenomenon? And he actually says, no, human beings cultivating the earth and having gardens is actually better for wildlife yeah. because we extend the whole pollination season rather than just, you know, there being three months that bees can get pollen from flowers. And he's he's speaking against this idea, I think, that human beings can only ever have a negative mm. impact on the environment. And we always have to retreat from it because we're hurting it when actually the opposite is true. Um, and I think what's interesting as well is there's all this alarmist re rhetoric at the same time that there's growing skepticism yeah. around net zero. And people are actually starting to look at it and say, hang on a minute, is this the right solution? I'm not sure it's worth it. I don't want to lose my living standards. And that's basically what they're proposing. Because you are seeing, starting to see things bubble up, particularly in Europe. I mean, if you think, or in the UK, you know, we had the revolts uh, in Uxbridge against ULES where Labour really should have won that seat, but were uh, the useless Tories were given, um, you know, voters used the Tories to give Labour a kicking instead of the government. You've had Dutch farmers protests, you've had the Gilets jaunes, all, all related to environmental taxes and things like that. You know, can net zero really survive contact with the public when people realise how punishing it is? Well, I would, I would throw into the mix road closures. So yeah. in my local area, we've had low traffic neighborhoods mm. and it means that posh roads are closed down and all the traffic is literally in the case of Waltham Forest, driven down uh, a poorer road. Yeah. <laughs> so all the exhaust and, and traffic is literally moved from a posh bit of the uh, borough to a poorer bit. And of course you have people tweeting saying, what's wrong with low traffic neighborhoods? My road is now so quiet. Yeah. My children can play football in the middle of the road without having to worry about cars. I can hear church bells and there are, there are bells. maids milking in the, the, in the middle of the street. And, and, and they just completely ignore the fact that the traffic has to go somewhere. Yeah. And of course, the traffic is going down the road where the poorer people live. That is actually happening in Waltham Forest. And you see this time and time again with environmental policy, that when it comes up against the brutal fact of modern life, mm. if you can call it that, when it comes up to the pra when the practical implications of these policies are put in front of people, people rightly reject them, and their elitist uh, character can be seen. Yeah, and in, in no case is that more clear than in road closures. Definitely, yeah. And there's this very strange. I think the car issue is fascinating because if you go on Twitter um, and you look up what people are saying about ULEs, look up what people are saying about low traffic neighborhoods. And you'd get the impression that driving was this kind of strange niche pursuit of sort of weird petrol heads and, you know, Jeremy Clarkson types, and they're probably racist too, I'm sure, um, rather than the main mode of transport for the people of this country. You know, there's 40 million registered drivers, it's like 88% of all journeys are taken by car. Yes. And yet pretty much everyone involved in policy making circles, they're against the car. They think it's actually a good thing if people stop driving. They're in favor, they say they're in favor of ULES because they want to save our lungs or something like that, or they want to save the planet. But really, they're quite happy that it would stop people driving. Completely ideologically driven. Most people have to do the school run every day. Mm. They have to get to work using their car. They get That's how they get their shopping. I mean, can you imagine, I mean, trying to like go about five different buses to pick kids up from nursery or to get an elderly relative to the hospital? I mean, yeah. how are you going to do that? I mean, it's just so poorly thought through. It's actually shocking. And it's, it's crazy that even <laughs> needs to be said. That's how kind of distant uh, these policies are. I mean, it is, at the end of the day, look, it is kind of um, an obsession of an elite. There isn't um, ordinary people, you know, in say the Red Wall towns aren't coming out saying we want net zero, give us more wind farms. <laughs> well, the, the, they're certainly not saying that. They're certainly not saying close our road to make low traffic yeah. neighbourhoods. They're certainly not saying we want you, Les. Mm. You know, when you put these um, policies up for democratic pressure, as we've seen in Uxbridge, they get rejected roundly. And I think politicians need to start taking notice. But the costs are huge. I mean, for things like heat pumps, I think most people cannot afford that. It's something like £10,000 to install yeah. a heat pump. I mean, how do they expect people to find money for that? It's £10,000 to install a heat pump, which is not as good as your gas boiler. It'll take you all day to heat it to the correct temperature. And then you probably also need to have your home re-insulated or, you know, redone because it's not up to the right spec for the heat pumps to work. You need to replace all your radiators because they need bigger radiators. And that's just one aspect of it. 
net zero is going to affect every area of our lives. So heat pumps, you know, we can say that's ridiculous, but then it's going to affect the way we travel. Um, it's going to affect agriculture. It's going to affect how we could produce our energy, how we construct buildings even uh, is considered environmentally unsound. And yet no one seems to have either thought this through, um, thought about the kind of punishing implications of this. Um, and they've certainly not consulted the public on whether we want it. Yes. And it's like we've been talking about these laws have been passed without any real consent from the public, very little debate, like you wrote about in mm. your, your spiked article. And a lot of in, in a lot of cases, the technology isn't even there. Yeah. So we could end up having this really chaotic transition in 2030, and then the net zero deadline's coming up in 2050, and it's law, mm. and we don't we, we don't even know if we'll be able to achieve it properly. It's a crazy situation. And you just hope that you know enough people rise up uh, against it, and we can put a stop to it before it causes real pain. Thank you so much for watching the Spikes podcast. We'll be back next Friday. If you hit subscribe and click the bell, you'll never miss an episode. And in the meantime, why not check out all of Spike's other videos and podcasts on this channel? And for more Spiked content, find us at spiked-online.com.